Today's discussion is Seljuk and early Persian. So here we have the map. It's an odd map because I think it's in Spanish or Italian. Uh, but uh, the Seljuk Empire, uh, you're very much familiar with it. It extended from uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet Central Asia, uh, where we have, as you see at the top right of the slide, Bakar and Samarkand uh, from current Uzbekistan, uh, all the way down into uh, Turkmenistan, into Iran. You see the capital city, Isfahan, uh, in the center. As we go further towards the west, Tabriz up into Armenia, Ani and Kars are on this map. Uh, in Iraq, you have Mosul and Baghdad, and then further to the Mediterranean and around current Turkey. Uh, the Seljuk Empire lasted about 1000, 1050, up to about 1250 AD. Uh, and obviously it was driven by these Turkmen forces uh, that uh, spread from Central Asia all the way to Turkey. Uh, so a nomadic civilization uh, that swept across these various areas uh, with actually very sophisticated capital cities uh, from Samarkand to Bukhara to Isfahan uh, and all the way into areas of Asia Minor and currently Turkey. The object or the building I want to start with today is this little tomb. So it's not a mosque, it's an actual tomb. It is on a square floor plan. Uh, all tombs uh, are on a square uh, floor plan. Uh, so it's like a cube with a dome over it. So again, it's a, a reiteration of the, the dome on top of the uh, canopy uh, from the throne of God on earth. Uh, it is reminiscent of the Kaaba. It is reminiscent of, in Baghdad, uh, the city gates. So the dome over a cubic or geometric uh, perfect base. But what we see here is, again, very much similar to what we've had before. You know, when we're talking about a nomadic culture, Central Asian culture, uh, they did not have long traditions of architecture and building. Because as mentioned last time, many of these cultures, uh, being nomadic, uh, did not want to invest a tremendous amount of money and energy into permanent structures. They want everything to be very portable uh, and uh, transportable uh, from city to city or currently country to country. So it was generally these tombs of the great leaders, of the great prophets, that received the maximum amount of elaboration. The building that we see here is in the Uzbek city of Bokhara. Um, it is actually quite small. Uh, it's hard to tell from the actual photograph. Uh, all four sides are the same size. Uh, so it is an actual cube uh, with a semicircular uh, perfect dome, half circle dome, uh, half sphere dome at the very top. And many of the elements that we've seen before, uh, this is made out of brick. And because it is brick, there is much more flexibility in the manipulation of those blocks uh, as they are set permanently into those walls. Uh, so there, some can be set a little further outward, some a little recess to give very much, as we mentioned last time, the basket weave effect. So even though all the bricks are the same color, there's a tremendous amount of visual variety in terms of light versus dark on the surfaces of those walls. So we have the doorway. The doorway has a pointed arch. Last time in the Umayyad in Spain, we saw the arch became more of a horseshoe arch. Uh, this is more of a traditional uh, Asian or Central Asian arch, uh, pointed arch as we've had uh, in Damascus and in Baghdad and other places. Uh, so, and then around it, we have an elaboration of the doorway and then the basket weave designs that go horizontally as well as vertically uh, throughout. I call it basket weave design because it actually looks like the warp and the weft of weaving. If you actually look closely at a basket, uh, you can see um, how the various reeds uh, are under and over, under and over, under and over 
of various elements. It's the same thing with the weaving of a rug. Uh, so uh, in a, more so in a basket, uh, you have that sense of uh, recess and projection as it is woven you know, in behind, in front, behind, in front of various elements. So it's a very simple ethnic folk type of mentality, uh, but now realized in brickwork. Uh, so even though this building is more than a thousand years old, uh, it's in beautiful condition and very well represents the attitude towards uh, that proliferation of geometric ornament with a little sense of horror vacui uh, to give a sense of visual uh, tension and excitement. Next slide. Here we see the same building from the side. Uh, so you see all four sides are identical. Uh, some have a functional doorway, some do not have a functional doorway, so the staircase is only from one side. Uh, but that sense of livening up surfaces uh, in order to create a sense of beauty, a sense of magnificence uh, to the actual structure. So here we have a detail of one of the doorways. And again, you see how some of those shadows are really very deep. Uh, some of the recesses are very much moved backward. Uh, even in the vertical lines on the left and to the right, in the upper portion, you actually do have a sense of a weaving. And even on the lower portion itself, you can actually see like those horizontal threads uh, that would have gone under, over, under, over uh, uh, the various vertical lines. Uh, so I think you actually have a very good sense of this uh, decorative mentality. But again, it's all brick. Uh, the bricks have been a little bit carved, molded in certain ways while they're still wet, uh, but when they dry, they could easily be put into place uh, to create as much uh, drama, uh, visual drama as you see here. And then obviously some of that patterning, repetition and pattern is also being translated into the wooden doorway itself. Here we are inside of the structure. And you see many of the same uh, geometric patterns are uh, repeated internally. The shape of that pointed arch is repeated internally. Here we're looking upward at the various windows uh, where the walls meet the dome and then the dome up above. Again, it's a very small building and I think small buildings can better uh, better represent the sense of ornamental fussiness uh, than a large building. Because in a large building, we get very boring, tedious, overstated, overpowering. But in a small building, all of this decoration, all of this wall surfaces, uh, the ornaments uh, work very, very well. So here we see some other tomb towers. Uh, these are more cylindrical rather than cubic, so they're called more uh, tomb towers. Uh, these exist throughout all of Central Asia, uh, not just from Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, uh, but all the way into Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, so these are very common sites, uh, but as you see, the tremendous amount of horror vacui on the surfaces in that exact same uh, arch shape. So actually you can distinguish uh, the country or the time period from which a building comes by the shape of their arches. But this obsession with surface decoration, as I said, it works very well with brick and it works very well in relatively small buildings that are simply uh, perceived for their beauty their elegance, and obviously as tombs, uh, they bring much more dignity uh, to the deceased, the people who are buried uh, inside. So I want to uh, go back to some vocabulary. Uh, we haven't had these terms before, uh, but I want to introduce them at this point because we're going to be using them uh, for the remainder of the course. Now, the niche of the lamps 
Uh, last class, when we looked at Umayyad Spain and we look at the Fatimid, we saw some luxury objects. And one class were these glass lamps uh, that would have been used as oil lamps within mosques or other very uh, important uh, sites, political or spiritual. Those glass lamps are also equated with, as we see here, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. The likeness of his light is as a niche wherein is a lamp. The lamp is in a glass. The glass is, as it were, a shining star. Here we have the equating of lamp with light, with God, with shining star, with the mihrab arch, the niche. So there's a lot going on in just these few lines. But that relationship of lamp with light, with God, with mihrab arch, and so forth, we're going to see in various manifestations in the arts, and that is also a very key decorative element within rugs and rug decorations uh, from this period onward. Now the Iwan uh, is going to be an architectural element. It is the gateway uh, into a mosque uh, that there is an added elaboration to the entryway, not into the mosque complex, but into the assembly hall itself. Uh, so we're going to see examples of that. It is developed during this early Persian period uh, that we're looking at today. Uh, but even if you go to the mosque here in Yerevan, uh, you can see Iwans. Scrafito is a, uh, we saw examples of it in Samara in the Abbasid period, and we had some examples of it last time uh, in Umayyad, Spain. It is when it looks like the artist has carved into a surface, whether it be stone, whether it be clay, whatever it is, carved or incised or engraved lines into the surface. So it's lines cut into the surface. So that is scurfito. The word itself is Italian, uh, but is used universally for that type of uh, applying ornament to a surface. You carve it into the surface. An arabesque, again, another term that is used internationally, uh, but it is this vine scroll flowing, curving line. Uh, so that the arabesque, it's obviously, that's a French term, it's an Arab-like line, Arab-style line, a line associated with North African cultures, uh, but it represents that vegetation, that vine scroll that we've seen many times before. Okay, so in these various buildings, we're going to have scrofito. Uh, we're going to have the concept of the niche. We're going to have the concept of that line that flows organically, whether it simulates grass or flowers or vines, whatever it is. So there is a tension between the organic fluid, fluid movement and geometry. So here we have an arch, a mihrab arch. So the arch again represents the light, okay? Uh, and on that surface, again, it's that slightly pointed, it's a narrow pointed arch, which represents Seljuk and Central Asia. And within that arch, you have this constantly meandering, flowing arabesque line. These vines that overlap, interweave, interflow uh, to give a sense of the rhythms of nature. But within that large field, everything here is horror vacua. Everything is, every square millimeter is decorated to the maximum. So you have this overflowing lace-like effervescence of fluid movement. Uh, but then all of a sudden you have a very geometric border around it. You have like a horizontal zone, or you have the frame around the arch itself, 
or you have other frames even farther out. So you have the tendency for organic soft movement with very rigid boundaries and outlines. And then you have script. So when you look at that outside frame going up the left side, across the top and down the right side, or maybe I did it backwards, up the right side, across the top and down the left side, there is this, you have organic, you have geometric, and then you have the word. Uh, so it is the layering of these three of visual elements um, and literally layering them one on top of another uh, that creates this sense of heightened animation and beauty as defined by the Seljuk mentality. The most famous of these mihrab arches are, is this one, also from Seljuk. It is from the Kushan, uh, excuse me, it is from Kashan, uh, which is an area in Iran uh, that is very well known for ceramic glazes. So you got the brick, the clay, but it is covered with a glaze. So many of you have already had experience with creating pottery uh, and putting glazes on pottery and then firing it. Uh, so you have to fire the brick first then you take the brick out and then you glaze it, you put the liquid color and then you have to fire it again to create these very durable, glassy, glossy glazes on the surface. Um, obviously much of the technology that they are using during the Seljuk period originated in China and Japan in centuries before. So again, uh, this is technology is from the Silk Route uh, coming from east to west. We even have a color scheme that is very typical of China, which is the blue. Uh, China is very well known for the blue and white, uh, but the white isn't actually pure white. Uh, in China, the white is more of a celadon. It is like a beigey green. Uh, so it's the blue against this beigey green type of background. In Japan, because their porcelain and clay was different, uh, they were able to get a better contrast of blue with pure white. Uh, but China doesn't have the pure white background. So again, this is the niche. This is the light of lights. This is the Qibla wall, the Mihrab arch pointing to Mecca, also pointing upwards the verticality. So you have two little columns in the center with an arch, a little more geometric than we've seen before. Then we have two taller columns with another arch above it. So mathematical repetition and geometry. And then we have that big frame around it with a script. But with inside of those fields, underneath that script, the script is on top of ornament, but underneath the script, within those arches, between those columns, we have the arabesque line, that beautiful flowing organic sense of linear movement. Now, these things have gotten to the point where it's really not a vine, it's just a line. It's really not a flower, it's just lines. So even though the original inspiration came from the forces and fluidity of nature, there is a tremendous sense of simplification into two-dimensional design. So everything becomes lines on a flat surface. Okay, vocabulary. I got arabesque up there again because you can't forget it. The other term I want to introduce is inverse similitude. Okay, that's, there's a lot of syllables there. Similitude means it's similar. So similitude means that it looks like something. Okay, similitude would be like, it's naturalistic, it's realistic. It's a simulation of something that exists in the real world. Inverse 
You know, inverse means opposite. So it is the opposite of a simulation. It is the opposite of naturalism. It's the opposite of something that looks similar to those things in the real world. So inverse similitude refers to art that deliberately is trying to be anti-naturalistic. It's deliberately trying to avoid the representation of the world as it appears. So we have already seen that there is in Islam a hesitation to, for naturalism, a hesitation to represent the world as seen, being that it may have an issue with divine authority and competing against God for the creation of visual imagery in the world in which we live. But the issue that I have here on the slide, what we're going to see now is that figural representations, representations of figures, representations of people are now going to be seen as art because now they're realizing that an image with human people can be more edifying. It can teach better. You know, that's one of the problems. I mentioned before that perhaps one of the reasons why Islam began uh, being anti-icon, that it was an-iconic. They didn't want representations of Mohammed. They didn't want representations of saints and prophets in their various religious buildings uh, because uh, it was people would get uh, confused these are not the real people, they're just images of the people. Uh, you should not be praying to them. That was the fear in Catholicism. Uh, so we don't know if because Islam evolved at the time during this icon ban in the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, whether um, that was the main purpose. But by 867, the Catholic Church decided, oh, we got to bring back visual art. We got to bring back representations of people because it's a better way to tell the stories of the religion. So it took Islam a little bit later, but now during the Seljuk period and during the early Persian period, we do have the reintroduction of figures uh, in art uh, for educational purposes. So here we're seeing a plate. And the plates produced, especially in early Persia, we're talking about 1100, 1200, are absolutely gorgeous. Each town became known for a different uh, technology in regard to the firing and glazing of plates. Uh, so like Kashan became very well known for this type of luster wear. Uh, where the glazes were like copper or gold or bronze. Uh, the glazes had like a metallic tone to it uh, that was, again, like akin to gold. Uh, so it gave the plates a beautiful sense of preciousness. These objects, these plates would not have been used in a kitchen uh, for food service. So these are, again, a part of that luxury uh, commercialized market. Uh, for beautiful consumer products. So the glaze is, you know, very expensive, uh, very carefully controlled, you know, secret formulas for the glazes. Uh, so certain workshops became famous in Iran uh, for these various products. Uh, here we have two figures, a male and a female. Again, you can discuss the empirical spiral versus uh, the uh, more flowing, open, uh, tangential, hyperbolic spirals. Uh, every, it's horror vacui. Uh, it is filled with geometric elements that are very sharp edge uh, versus more organic flows uh, around and uh, between the figures. Uh, even as you look at the man's garment, he's the man is on the right, and you look at the woman's garment on the left, 
and you look at the patterns and the negative space between them, who does it remind you of? What artist, more contemporary artist, does it remind you of? Think about Gustav Klimt and the kiss. I should have had it in this slide uh, as a comparison, but isn't this very similar to Gustav Klimt and the kiss? He has the horror vacui, he has a contrast of patterns, the patterns that the figures on the figures' garments are more geometric, and then all of the negative space around them are little curls and curves and flowing lines uh, that again are similar to the arabesque. This is the most famous of all the Persian plates. Again, it's Kashan ware uh, because it has that copper, bronzy, gold type of glaze. Uh, so if we start at the very edges, uh, there you have your script. So the script tells a story. This is a very specific literary reference. Uh, so you have the written word as well as the visual representation. So the source of inspiration, again, it's a household object. It's not an object for a mosque. It's a household object, so it can be from love poetry. It can be from a novel. It could be from any source of literature. So we have a man in the bottom left. You see him bent over, almost asleep, head on his knee in a triangular fashion. There he is in the bottom left. And he's having a dream. And he dreams of this beautiful woman floating in the water. And you see her below. We know that she's in the water because she's surrounded by fish. And we have above her this like flowing line, uh, which obviously represents the surface of the water. She's like a mermaid. Uh, she is like a nymph of the waters. So he's dreaming of this almost dream girl, this beloved. It's love poetry. And then up above on this horse, we have like five women uh, who represent ideals of beauty, who represent the goddesses, who represent those who govern the ways of love uh, in human souls. So it is a very enchanting, very beautiful image. So if we start at the, let's start at the top with those five women. You can sort of see their clothing. Some have geometric, some have floral patterns, some have polka dots. Again, a tremendous sense of visual variety. Look at the horse. The horse has spots on its body uh, that really are plant forms, but create a beautiful contrast of dark spots on a light background. The sleeping prince, the sleeping man, again, he is a horror vacui decorated robe with a beautiful sense of golden design of flowing arabesque lines and everything in the and then you see all the negative space the space between the horse's legs between the horse and the man the horse and the outside of the dish of the plate and everything is this beautiful organic movement nothing is inert nothing is quiet solid stable it is a representation of life force in its most elemental way that there is nothing dead there is no such thing as a void there's no such thing as a vacuum uh, every square millimeter is filled with beauty it's filled with god's light it's filled with a sense of animation Now, so the next question is, is there, this an imperial or a hyperbolic spiral? So the center point obviously is the horse. So maybe the horse itself, the horse's torso is the center point. We take it a little larger, we take in the women's heads. We take it a little larger and we have the whole top of the vase the whole top of it, uh, of the plate, from their heads down to, see how their heads, if we go left to right, start at the five heads, then go to the right, 
we have these branches, these tree branches. That's a part of the circular design. So I got five heads. I got a tree branch that goes all the way down to the horse's foot. I go across the line of the water, the other horse's feet. Then I have the man's feet. The man's back curves up. And then I have another branch on the left that leads me back up to the woman's heads. So that's another circle. So the horse's body is a circle. Then I have this larger circle of heads, bodies, and branches. Then I can make another larger circle where I take in the water nymph and the fish in the sea. This is probably more of an empirical spiral, not as beautifully and clearly defined as during the Abbasa period, but still, even if it looks very abstract, it looks very distorted in terms of proportion, obviously there's no mass, there's still a sense of organizing element and principle and a higher level of aesthetic. But during these periods, uh, we also have uh, manuscript illumination, and we really haven't seen much of that before. It becomes much more prominent in these Islamic cultures, especially in Iran and Iraq, uh, during the Seljuk and early Persian periods. And quite often, they do have a didactic and educational purpose. Here, obviously, we have the Archangel Gabriel, who is coming to talk to Muhammad. So nowadays, you rarely have an image of Muhammad uh, in any type of representation, uh, any religious context. But here we have Muhammad uh, with the Archangel Gabriel, who obviously gave him the directions uh, to follow the religious path. Um, I want you to look at, well, there are a variety of elements here. First, again, there is the cloud pattern uh, for the mountains, for the ground line uh, that we generally associate with China. So we've seen that in many countries before. When we look at the faces of Archangel Gabriel and Muhammad, Again, it is based on much of what we've seen before from the Mongol and Central Asian traditions uh, that came through the Silk Route uh, from China. When we look at the fabric, the fabric is a little bit the Christmas tree, right? The fabric is the Christmas tree. Look at Muhammad's fabric as it moves to the bottom right corner of the picture. It's the Christmas tree little points over and over and over again. And we even have an Archangel Gabriel going to the bottom left corner of the painting uh, where the drapery is flowing in the winds in these very pointed triangular elements. So it's very much silk roots. It's very much that synthesis of various uh, styles that have come before. And some beautiful elements like the wings those wings of Gabriel are beautifully done. Almost looks like Natalie Portman from Black Swan. Uh, but here again, that sense of flow of line, the importance of line and the movement of line with geometric simplicity, but now with narrative figural elements. So inverse similitude it is a man, an angel, a landscape, but through the arabesque line and through the abstract shapes, through the Christmas tree fabric, it becomes unearthly. So I don't know if you can figure out this narrative, but you have the very big fish and then a man in the bottom left. Who's this? This is Jonah and the whale. So we have the script going around it, like uh, the borders that we see uh, saw in the Mihrab arches in the previous examples. But again, the fish looks very Chinese. It looks like a koi pond, and the ver those uh, the carp. Uh, that are very common in China. And then we have the arabesque line. Look at the flow of the water around the fish's body. Beautifully done. Uh, very decorative. And then we have this man in the bottom left. 
uh, that has just been discharged by the whale or fish. In some accounts, they call it uh, Jonah was swallowed by the whale. In some accounts, say uh, by a large fish. So this is a Judeo-Christian, biblical, Old Testament story uh, that represents faith in God and people are tested and you just have to persevere and you will survive and you will be rewarded. Um, that is the basic element here. So these images are role models. Uh, they are people to be adored, uh, people to be honored. Uh, it is edifying. Remember we said the purpose of a Hindu temple, the purpose of a stupa, is to educate people. Uh, so that is what we have uh, in these examples, even though it's a more private manuscript rather than a public monument. So here we have a prince. And so this would be a military hero. So we've seen Muhammad. We've seen Old Testament. Here we see contemporary political uh, military heroes. So there he is on his horse. Uh, this could be St. George because St. George slays the dragon. You see this dragon composite creature uh, has been killed underfoot. Uh, so it either could be St. George or any prototype of the righteous king or righteous prince uh, who destroys evil creatures, evil demons, whatever the narrative may be. So the artists always go like halfway. I can recognize what's in there. It's a man on a horse. It is a demon. The demon is killed. I got a forest. I got a landscape. But there's some point at which the artist goes in the realm of abstraction. All of a sudden simplifies it. Doesn't have light and shade. Doesn't have much in the way of edge shading doesn't have much in the terms of perspective or depth or gradation of colors to give a sense of the roundness of a body. None of that. So the artist actually knows how far he or she can go in the representation of these images. And when they get to that certain point, they draw back and go into either stereotypical Chinese trees, stereotypical Chinese clouds, stereotypical Chinese fabrics, uh, clothing, or else uh, the arabesque line and patterning. So here's a ceramic plate that again has a prince, uh, this time a prince and an assistant, and they're obviously traveling on the back of a camel and uh, going hunting. We understand it, but there is a level of abstraction that the artist does not compete with God's creation. Perhaps one of the most famous of all of the compositions is this one that represents the death of Alexander the Great. It's probably hard to see it in there. Let's just start with a big picture and we see looks like a mixture of people from the Silk Route. Uh, you may think they look Persian, Central Asian, Mongol. Uh, it is this ethnic hybrid of various figures, men to the left, men to the right. At the very bottom of the scene, we have women who have their hands on their heads. Uh, they are wailing, they are kneeling before uh, the, uh, the body of Alexander. We see that Alex, there's like a bed uh, underneath a canopy. So again, God's thrown on earth, uh, the typical shapes over and over again. Now in the front, I'll try to explain it. In the front, we see a woman leaning to the right. We see higher value robe on her lower body. Her upper body is in brown and black with a scarf or shawl over her head, a veil over her head. She is twisting to the right, her arms are raised above her head. She's wailing over the corpse of Alexander the Great. You cannot see his body. His body is completely covered by a blanket. 
So you see the lower part of the body has like a gold fabric with vertical, from our perspective, vertical pleats, vertical lines, and the, his head is covered on the right side of that woman uh, by that orange red, tomato red uh, type of uh, blanket or covering. On the far side of the bed, uh, we have two men who also are uh, mourning his death. Obviously, Alexander the Great represents uh, one of the most famous military and political figures of world history. And he conquered almost all of this area that we're currently talking about as being a part of the Seljuk territory. Uh, so from Greece, he went into Turkey, into modern day Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, Tajikistan, uh, and so forth. So it's about honoring great people uh, and show and using them as models for human behavior uh, into the future. One of the reasons why this composition is so difficult to read is because of the horror vacui. There are too many people. You look at the floor. The floor is too highly decorated. The bed is too highly decorated. The backgrounds are the walls. And even you see on the right above those men, on the left above those men, there you have the hanging lamps. And even in the center, the curtains are pulled apart and you have a lamp hanging from the ceiling over the body of Alexander the Great. So these are very much, these are in metal, but they're very much like the glass lamps, uh, oil lamps that we saw uh, produced in Syria and uh, Egypt uh, last class. So in each of these cities in Iran, we have a different uh, style of composition, of organization of these plates. Uh, so Kashan, Minai ware, Ray ware, uh, these are all very famous uh, production sites uh, for these very beautiful uh, plates and ceramics. So you can either look at this example as light on dark, you know, that high value white against a very glistening gold, bronzy gold, or you can actually see the details of all these figures. Again, is this an empirical spiral or a hyperbolic spiral? Uh, so you have the main figure at the center point and everybody radiating outward in various circles. So now I want to go into some architecture and obviously one of the most famous sites uh, for buildings of this era is Samarkand, uh, currently in Uzbekistan. And again, it's brick buildings. You can see the orangey color of the bricks. And obviously, if you know your color wheel, the opposite of orange is going to be blue. Uh, so therefore, uh, we see blue tiles, uh, ceramic tiles against the orange surface. Uh, it also creates a nice contrast between the relatively rough surface of the bricks versus the smooth, glossy, glassy texture of the ceramics. Uh, so again, this is a tomb. Uh, so it's a place of beautiful magnificence of, of uh, Tamerlane. Uh, so we're going to look at a few details of this particular structure. If you walk all the way around it, uh, to the back of the mausoleum, you actually can see uh, the structure. Uh, before in Bokhara, we saw a cube, so that's four sided. Uh, here we get into a structure that is uh, multi sided, it's uh, eight sided. Uh, so you have these uh, polygonal variations, uh, but again, it is glazed brick. So you have, even on the wall surface, glaze versus unglazed. So the glaze surface is going to be like a turquoise, an aqua blue versus the orangey red of the actual brick. But what you start to see in this period and onward is an extreme sophistication in the balance 
of geometry, pattern, repetition, ornament, lines versus script, in very beautiful combinations. I like it. So it's horror vacui. Every little bit is filled in, but it's not overpowering. So that could either be because they still use a limited number of colors. Maybe it's the color choices that that medium blue, that turquoise blue with that color of brick, it's not really an orange, it's not really a blue. It's not really a yellow, it's not really a purple. It's these middle tones. And when they are perfectly juxtaposed, it really can be very interesting. So you have like in the lower level, some of the bricks are glazed, some are not. So you have the turquoise on the actual brick. So that's more of a matte finish. When you get to the drum of the dome, go to the second floor, it's shiny. It's very shiny, which means that it all is glazed because brick doesn't shine. So it's more of a dead surface. On the second floor, it's all shiny. And then when you look at the dome itself, okay, it looks like a amalaka, a grooved disc, amalaka, right? It's that same concept. I don't know if they get it from India. They could have, I don't know. But it's like a grooved amalaka. But here, that's all turquoise. Then you have vertical recesses in it. It really is a every floor, the first floor, second floor, and then in the dome. Tremendous amount of variety, even though it's a very limited color scheme, very limited geometric uh, idea. So here you have a detail, but even that turquoise dome is not a flat colored consistent color turquoise dome. Even as you look at it, you can see a little bit, it's turquoise blue, but also dark blue, also orange, also a little bit of red. So if it were just turquoise blue, what just one color, it would still look very flat. But be having a little bit of warm color, a little bit of high value, a little bit of white, a little bit of orange, a little bit of red, even that dome surface is alive in and of itself. So again, everything is horror vacua. Everything is filled in space. And here's another detail. You see the transition from the drum of the dome, or what we called a few moments ago, the second floor, into the dome itself. And look at how, how much is going on in that space. So in the lower level, the brick, you see natural brick with no glaze, with some bricks with navy blue, some with turquoise, a nice little positive negative pattern. Maybe it looks like little crosses in the middle of those tri uh, diamond shapes. Then you go up above. So let's start. That lower level is orange brick with blue and turquoise on it. We get to the next level and it's turquoise with navy blue and orange on top of it. It's like a reversal. What's the background color? The lower level, the background color is the orange. Then we get to a level where the background color is the turquoise, where the orange looks like the added color. So they're constantly playing with positive negatives, reversals of various patterns. That is, is very, inter uh, very interesting. So now we walk inside the courtyard. So in many of these mausoleum, uh, we have a courtyard, just as in a mosque format. And there, straight ahead, we have that recess, that large recess, that, that again, we can use the word Iwan. The Iwan is a large recess uh, for the entryway. It's like a sheltered, arched gateway into the building. Uh, and, uh, and then we can see the dome from the other side. But even here, with the fake arches, 
it's the orange brick. It's that same decorative scheme throughout. And then you even see the script up above it as that border. And just to show you, when you go inside, those are the coffins of the royal family uh, going all the way back to 1400, uh, the era of Tamerlane, uh, Timur, and the walls. So you have the like zones, horizontal zones. One horizontal zone is just simple shapes. The next one, the horizontal zone, is a very full pattern. Next horizontal zone is script. Next horizontal, so it is this, but everything is the same color scheme. It's still the blue and the orange all the way through. To show a few more examples in other place where the Seljuks um, left behind uh, some very beautiful buildings, um, this is in Turkey. And in this case, we see, again, an entryway uh, into this mausoleum. And that would be the E1. I want to show you a detail of the E1 because this is going to be very typical. We're going to start to see that that entryway, that arched, curved entryway, has more depth. And above your head as you enter, it looks like this. Uh, in Spain, they call it macarnas, uh, but I think it's better for us to say it simply looks, it looks like a cave. It looks like uh, stalactites. So you're looking up at the cave, you're looking at a cave ceiling, and you see all of these shapes that have been created over the centuries because of the dripping of water and other mineral deposits. It has the sense of scalloped, caved uh, little recesses uh, that give it a sense of, again, uh, busyness. It's just not a scooped out dome shape. Instead, it has all of these small little, it's small little domes, it's small little concave elements, it's small little scoops uh, out of the surface. So even that becomes horovacuai, even that becomes animated to a tremendous degree. Here we see it again. I want you to have that sense of all these little units, all these blocks of stone within this porch within this entryway are now carved, each block carved separately with its own little recess, its own little inner scooping form that gives it a sense of this like back cave, this sense of tremendous decoration. So here we're in Isfahan and this is the large mosque Again, this is from the 1200s. There's the big courtyard. There you have your water uh, for your ablutions, for the washing. And generally, on all four sides of the courtyard, you're going to have a very large entryway. Only one goes into the mosque, the assembly hall. The others will provide entry into the madrasa or other functions of the mosque. So one could be the school, the madrasa, one could be the dormitories uh, for the students and the, uh, at the madrasa. Uh, so these complexes were more broader educational uh, than just uh, a mosque for uh, prayers. So here we're looking at two of them. And there's something you need to observe. Let's look at the one on the right, the entryway on the right. These are the E1s. This is exactly what we mean at E1. It's this grand entryway, recessed, recessed entryway. When you look at the inside of that entryway, you got again these scalloped, carved forms that give a sense of like a cave ceiling. If 
but not without that metaphor. It's just a decorative element. And then you have the flat. So you have the flat surface of the glazed brick or the glazing over the stone. And then you have this recess. So it's light versus shadow, surface versus recess, all of those contrasts we saw before. And like we've seen before, it is that like that tan buff type of stone color against the blues and the purples uh, that are very prominent in the uh, glazed uh, color scheme. But for that tremendously elaborate entryway, gateway, doorway, E1, what's behind it? Nothing. It's a fake front. There's nothing behind it. Because you would think if you have this grand entryway, you have a huge building behind it. You have a 10-story building behind it, a magnificent building behind it. This is only a show front. There's nothing behind it. It's just a gateway. And the building is just on the first and second floors. So here we have another example. We're looking at the one that actually leads into the uh, prayer hall. Uh, so again, you have these curved out, carved out, stalactite type of elements uh, coming down from the ceiling, scalloped edges, and you walk under that in order to get uh, into the congregation. A beautiful surface, again, of that orange versus shades of blue, that turquoise, very prominent. But there's nothing behind that doorway. There's nothing behind, I mean, the doorway, there is a building there, but there's nothing behind that gateway. This looks like four stories tall, but the building is only two stories tall. It's all image. So here we're inside, so not only is it the main entryway, uh, but even internally you'll have this type of doorway, uh, this type of E1. So this is the one we did just look at, and we can see uh, how each scalloped element becomes very much its own shape, its own identity. Here, each has some script on it. So it's the orange against the blue. Uh, so again, you walk underneath it. So here's some more details of more elaborate Ewans uh, within the complex. So they can get extremely elaborate over time in terms of these little, I don't know how you want to call it. I call it stalactites because I think of like a cave ceiling. It doesn't look like bats, like a bat cave. I don't know, but there is something organic or geological about it. Uh, so you probably can come up with your own metaphor uh, for how to describe it. So I'm just going to finish up by showing you a couple examples of wall surfaces uh, in Samarkand uh, as well as in Persia. And we can easily see uh, the beauty of those ceramic tiles as they completely cover the surface. Again, it's that same art shape, narrow, comes to a point. That is the Central Asian Seljuk uh, art shape. Again, it is the natural color of the building material against the ceramic tiles. So obviously the coloration of the ceramic tiles depends on what the natural building material is. So if it is this very pinkish, in this slide it's a very pink uh, brick. When it's fired it gets very pink. You have to adjust your blues and purples in order to match that pink. Uh, so it's still opposites on the color wheel, but it's like an off shade, a pastel shade, a half shade, uh, what we generally call it, that gives these an added level of uh, sophistication. So again, you have some elements here that are geometric and some elements that are very much the arabesque, uh, the free flow arabesque line. Uh, is a mihrab arch. And again, you see the geometry, the script, and the arabesque overlapping each other. It's like one layer over another layer over another layer, but still, and it's very busy, it's very horror vacui, but somehow it still works. 
So it's like, how far can I take these basic tools that have been given to me in terms of line, shape, and color, and how can I maximize the visual experience? And here's an image of a dome. We're looking straight up into a dome, and you see the same basic issues. So the decorative schemes that were developed, especially during the Seljuk and early Persian periods, these are the visual patterns from the lantern to the arabesque to the geometry to the script that you have in rugs. So actually, Persian rugs or Central Asian rugs, and to some extent Caucasian rugs, represent these historical patterns and these historical attempts to reconcile geometry with the organic and also to find these perfect color combinations, color juxtapositions, color contrasts that will create a much more dynamic image. Now generally, as I said, in many of these examples, blue is the predominant color in the glazing uh, because that's the technology they got from China. But in rugs, you're very much limited by organic dyes uh, that you can use for the dyeing of wool. So it's a different color palette, a different understanding of color contrasts uh, than what you can achieve uh, in the buildings and the services of the buildings we saw today. But this is where we start to get much of the visual vocabulary of the rugs and the rug type of design aesthetic. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, thank you.